30 Minutes with Ron. You must be in heaven. Playing for somebody. <laughs> play at Yankee Stadium. Beer barrel polka. Sterling's going to play on the violin, and uh, how many instruments do you play, Sterling? Well, right now I play the organ, piano, and violin, harmonica, but I used to play the trumpet, French horn, timpani, bass drum, and cymbals. I even played uh, alto horn out of college. Sometimes I would play the carillon in the chapel. So I also play the fife. I've been yeah. playing the fife for the Mantic drum band out of Waterbury for about 30 years. I think you mentioned the accordion at one point. Yeah, and I played the accordion all my life. And uh, <laughs> I used to play it at convalescent homes when I did my one-man show. I would do the flea circus, blow up balloons. I still have the balloons here in the pump. And my little monkey that played the harmonica, the, my monkey Chip, I don't remember if you ever saw that. I might have but, seen it uh, at Park and Rec or at the Harmon Leonard Youth Center. Yeah. Yeah. But to keep up my ability on the violin, I try to practice a half an hour, an hour a day. Right now I can play just one little tune for Go right ahead. Yeah. Uh, I belong to the, what's known as the Connecticut Bristol Old Time Fiddle Club. And we're a volunteer group, and I've been with them for about 25 years. And here's one of the tunes I play. It's a little peppy tune called the Chinese Breakdown. Let me see if I'm in tune. Okay, here we go.
Chinese breakdown often played by the Connecticut Bristol or Dime Fiddle Club. All right, now I'm going to do a little shot of the bed here because uh, these are going to come into play at some point. First of all, here's a picture of Sterling at age what? I was uh, actually... Look about 22, 24. 24. 24, yeah. And I graduated from Denison University. That was my picture. Yep. There's a picture of me <laughs> taken at St. Peter's Church by professionals about five or six years ago. Uh -huh. There I am playing at the Gaylord Hospital, where I played for about 15 years as a volunteer. Yeah. And uh, we were that doing looks like our, Pat Vita in the middle there. Is that, that Pat Vita? That's Pat Vita uh -huh. in the middle. And she at the time was a director of uh, volunteers. And uh, for many years, I would be playing for the Christmas party, room to room, while Santa Claus gave out presents. And we'd have 15 or 20 people, carolers, singing along with me. Nice. And uh, as I mentioned before, I played the accordion on Ted Mack's Amateur Hour. What happened, when we lived in Carl Place, Long Island, I belonged to the fire department, Carl Place Volunteer Fire Department. Yep. And we would give a band concert each year. And to get more people out, we decided we'd have a talent night. So at the time, I was the uh, organist at St. At St. John's Church down there. And uh, a couple of fellows came to me and said, uh, we'd like to be in the talent show. I said, well, you'd sound better if I got two other guys. So these two fellows, one played the guitar, one played the accordion, and a friend of mine who went to Dennis University, doctor of geology, who was involved with the Atomic Energy Commission during the war, he played the slap bass. Well, what happened the night of the concert, we had about 10 different contestants. And one fellow playing the trumpet, something happened to a piston, stuck on him. Somebody sang off key, and I was piano player for several people. Well, we four guys got up and did a hillbilly number, and they had a big applaud meter <laughs> on stage. And when they had the final judging, the audience they were the judges by applaud, the, the sound of their applause. Right. So when they said contestant number four, the campus rangers, that was our group, they clapped so loudly that the needle went as far as it could go on this dial. <laughs> so we won, and it was agreed upon that whoever won would go down to Ted Max and be auditioned. We were down there in the summertime. I should add, though, the Ted Mack Hour, or was a, talent show hour, whatever they called it, was like one of the major things on television and radio for quite some time. Yeah, it was a little bit like the Ed Sullivan Show. Right. And it was actually a leftover from the uh, uh, show that we went down to when we were auditioning uh, in New York. And anyway, what happened on the Ted Mack program I was a spokesman for the group, and we had a few lines to memorize. And uh, we played this, oh, we played You Are My Sunshine. And what happened, that something went wrong with the picture, so no one saw us. <laughs> and they got the picture corrected when we had our last note. And because of that, they had us back on Thursday night for the radio program and the following Tuesday night for the TV program. So what year we was were this? actually on three, three times. What year? Uh, it was around 1951, I'm not sure. Yep. But anyway, what happened, there was a good looking gal there from New Orleans on the show, dressed in a beautiful leotard. And she said, are you Ted Mack? I said, no, may I help you? She said, my mother and father couldn't come up from New Orleans and I want someone to check the seams in the backs of my stockings. So I got down on my hands and knees and had the pleasure of adjusting her. It's a tough job, but somebody had to do it.
Someone had to. Yeah. But an interesting thing happened. My wife called the station to give some votes because the more points you got, the more votes you got, the more chance, the better the chance you would have of being on the show again to compete. Well, my two daughters were very young. They were propped up with pillows in front of our first television set watching. And my wife called the studio and said, I want to give some votes for the, well, I think we call ourselves the campus rangers there. And they said, how many people are at your house, at, at your party? My wife said, 30. <laughs> <laughs> so we got 30 votes. But we uh, did get a few jobs out of it uh, locally. Uh -huh. But uh, I must get on with my story. Sure. Um, well, before you go, I wanted to say that the reason I was showing the, the bed before, uh, these are some of the books that you've put together about your life. Oh, yeah. You certainly had an amazing life. Yeah. And you've also done a book about the Duran family, a vaudeville group in Cheshire that uh, you're like the expert on. <laughs> right. I meant to bring my book over and have you sign it, but I'll have to do that another day because I forgot. Okay. We... All right, so we've looked at this section. Now we'll go back over to the uh, interview part. Hold on, I'm going to fade out. Let me see. Here we go, fading to the stripes. Sterling's back out of the mosaic fade. Continue, sir. After I graduated from Denison University in Granville, Ohio, near Columbus, I had the luck, uh, a lot of luck. Dr. Detweiler, the head of the social, the head of the sociology department, got me a job as a social worker at the Boys Industrial School in Lancaster, Ohio. I worked there for two years. Knowing that the draft was going to call me someday, the draft board, and tell them I was ready to be in the military. I tried to get into the Navy, but was colorblind, so that was out. And uh, when I was out there in Lancaster, Ohio, I organized a double quartet, a dancing team, and uh, we had a Friday show that we would give to the uh, inmates. They had 500 inmates from nine years of age to 17. I would uh, interview them, get their, study their case histories from the juvenile courts, and then each week we had a guidance committee uh, decide what level of education, what grade they would be in, and what kind of work they would do. Very exciting work. But uh, then I decided I better move back to Ch Cheshire and be ready when the draft board called. And so I transferred my uh, status from Ohio back to my home in Cheshire. And uh, I got a job at Winchester Repeating Arms Company. I was in inspector of 19 machines, making machine gun bullets for the war effort. And uh, finally, I got my notice that I was going to uh, have to a report in the military. So my wife and I, just, my wife to be, and I decided we'd get married before I got into the military. So we were married in Baptist Church and. Yonkers, New York, March 7th, 1943. Uh, three weeks later, I was in a uniform. We had, the fellows from Cheshire had to go to Naugatuck and get a train at three o'clock in the morning and go to New Haven, where we were in this large building, and there were about 200 of us had to stand in line in the nude for two hours while we were all examined by the doctor. That could have been the Gough Street Armory. I think it was. Yeah. And um, the doctor would examine us from the front and also in the back and he would make us bend over and spread our cheeks and he would clap once and that would mean we would go on. And uh, the uh, 
the fellow in front of me had some kind of a social disease, I won't mention it, but he was rejected. But we were all then given our uniforms and we were, I was sent down to Camp Lake, Virginia for basic training. And because I had had five hours of psychology at school, and because of my typing background, my CCC work, I was a very fortunate person. I was assigned to classification <clears throat> and assignment duty, and our company, we had to keep within a few miles of the fighting front, and we would assign troops to the front lines to replace the wounded and killed. And after the war, we would assign fellows ships to go back to the States. So we didn't have a lot of excitement, and we were quite fortunate. We only lost a couple of men. But uh, an interesting thing happened after my special schooling in classification and assignment. We had combat duty down in New Orleans at Camp Harahan, and after that, we went up the river, the Hudson River, the staging area, for about two weeks. And each night, our first sergeant and I would come to Yon go to Yonkers and see our wives and not knowing when we were going to be shipped to Europe. All of a sudden, the, the word came that we were going, and we weren't allowed to call out of the camp. And we were taken by truck to New York Harbor, and there we were loaded onto the Aquitania, the third largest ship being used for tr uh, troop transport. And we had 10,000 men, U.S. Army personnel, on our ship. <clears throat> and we left uh, New York Harbor on December 12th, I believe, and it was around Christmas time when we arrived in Great Britain. A day before we arrived, we had a submarine alert and explosives were thrown, were catapulted off the ship. Death charge, right? Death charges. Yeah. And uh, we were lucky, nothing happened. And when we arrived in the Firth of Clyde, Gork, Scotland, there was the Queen Elizabeth and the Queen Mary right in the same harbor, all three of them ships were lined up there, and I thought, my goodness, if the Germans knew, <laughs> they would be sitting ducks. Uh, but anyway, our ship was too big to go to a dock, so we went by tender, and then on our train, down into England to Yeovil, which was 127 miles west of London. And we were in England for six months. I bought a bicycle and a fishing license. I never used a fishing license, but I used a bicycle. And my bicycle created a lot of curiosity because I wasn't supposed to be owning it because it had been a postal bike. And civilians were not supposed to use bikes that were postal bikes. But I never got in any trouble because of it. But uh, in England, uh, I was able to type letters home every day. I got to London about 12 different weekends on leave, and at least five or six weekends I was there, the Germans came over and bombed London so terribly. Sometimes it seemed that half of London was on fire, and emergency vehicles were going everywhere, and it was a horrible, horrible, frightening thing to witness. Now was this airplane bombing or was yeah, this airplane V1 bombing. rockets? <clears throat> Later on the V1 and V2 rockets uh, would be sent over by the Germans. <clears throat> but one night, it was very interesting, we were on a train ready to go back to camp in Yeovil 
and the sirens went off, the air raid sirens went off, and bombs were dropping everywhere. And we didn't dare get off the train because it might start up. And the train didn't start up. And after a half hour or more, an MP came on the train and gave us something that looked like a Western Union thing. He said, a bomb hit near the tracks, a mile up the tracks, and you'll be delayed two hours. Give this to your camp commander so you won't be classified as AWOL. But I said to Bill Larkin, my buddy, who was with me, I said, Bill, gee, what should we do? He said, nothing we can do about it, old man. All we had above us was a little rack where they put luggage for protection. But we got back to camp all right, <clears throat> and the Germans would come over once or twice a night right over our camp and bomb Liverpool. And every time the siren went, we, 300 fellows, would have to run out in the middle of the night and jump in the trenches with a gas mask and a, an overcoat. And we lost so much sleep when they came over twice a night that we stayed in bed to get more sleep. And half the fellows didn't, they slept in the nude. Well, one night, the Germans were coming over. We could always tell their four motor bombers because their engines were not synchronized. They would go, uh, 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 uh. Well, we heard three bombs whistling overhead. So the whole 300 of us in the middle of the night, it was the funny sight, funniest sight you would ever see. You could never put it in the movies. <laughs> but we jumped into the uh, tren trenches and unfortunately the bombs were a block away and they landed in a field, did a little damage to a school and a, a crossroads. <clears throat> but that was an interesting experience. And many nights when we were on duty to watch uh, air activity, we would see German planes, these big bombers, caught in the spotlight from the aircraft. Uh, the light, the lights. The sea lights or something? Yeah. And, uh, it was like a big star. And then you could see the tracer bullets going into the plane and it was, the plane would try to get out of the light and finally it would go to the ground and explode. And one night, uh, <clears throat> three of the Germans parachuted near our camp and a couple of Englishmen came with pitchforks for weapons, brought them to our camp. It was quite interesting. Yeah. But anyway, we knew that the big invasion of France was coming and because of the troop activity. And on uh, June 6, 1944, the invasion of Normandy took place. And uh, 19 days later, we were on our way across the channel, but before going across the channel, we had a wait in the staging area at Southampton. And while we were at Southampton, we saw these buzz bombs, V1 and V2. They sounded just like a motorboat, and you could see them, and they would go pop, pop, pop when they ran out of fuel. And some of them would go straight down, some would go a little bit farther, and then go down. And they would land near our camp, and our mess kits would rattle but we, none of us got hit. But going over to Normandy on the channel, English Channel, the guys would say, hey, you, you know French, teach us a few important things. How do you say, will you walk with me tonight or something worse than that? Voulez-vous promenade avec moi sur soir? Well, my brother and I had two years of French in Hill House, and we were so dumb, the teacher said, I'm going to flunk you guys, make you repeat the third year. But if you promise not to darken my doorway, I'll give you a C and get rid of you. So we got the C. And I really regretted that I had not done well in French. So we landed over there on Normandy, 
but we couldn't get all the way to shore. The bow of the boat came down and we had to wade through water uh, a little above our knees to shore. And, and it was two hours before uh, sundown and we marched toward the Brest Peninsula, which was still in German hands, but we walked, marched right through St. Mary Eglise, right on the sh near the shore there. And I saw a beautiful, beautiful brunette carrying a pail of milk. She just milked a cow. And I wanted to go up and say, you're the prettiest girl in the world, may I carry her milk? And then and there, I realized I was going to study French every chow line, which I did. And I, in time, became interpreter for the officers. I was a sergeant, eventually. And I memorized the story of Little Red Riding Hood in French. And I had more fun with that because my pronunciation was bad, but they all knew the story. And some of the old ladies, like grandmothers, they would cry with laughter. <laughs> and even though there was a language barrier, the French people seem more like Americans than the English, believe it or not. And, uh, but nevertheless, because of the nature of my work, as I mentioned, we had to kind of follow the fighting front so that we would have our record ready to give to the fellows that were being sent up to the front line. There would normally be three or four trucks, army trucks, loaded with 30 men or so, and there'd be a lieutenant we would give the army records to. And uh, it was a really sad thing because one lieutenant I was cracking jokes with, they went around they were half a mile Way when German planes came down and strafed, and even they got him. But uh, there were a lot of good things that happened in the service. We did have our time off. I got to Paris many times, and I was very, very thrilled to be in the victory parade in Paris a few days after the Germans left or were pushed out. We started at the Champs de Lisey, I mean at the, uh, the Tomb of, of the Unknown Soldier at the beginning of the Champs de Lisey, and there were thousands and thousands of uh, U.S. troops in that parade. And I was fortunate to be in a jeep. We had a sergeant driver, a major, a captain lieutenant, and yours truly. And the parade would stop every few minutes, as most parades do, and there were thousands and thousands of French people throwing flowers at us, and we would give out cigarettes, chiclets, and cigars, and the girls would come up and kiss our cheeks. I had more lipstick on my face at the end of the parade. It was, it was fun, fun, fun.